Climb into the saddle and prepare to travel back in time as we uncover the top 10 gunfights of the wild old west. These epic showdowns, filled with drama, courage, and the spirit of the frontier, are the stuff of legends. But, before we ride into the dusty trails of history, make sure to subscribe to American Old West Tales. Hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell to join us on our journey through the iconic tales of the American frontier. Let's saddle up and ride into the heart of the Wild West. On April 4, 1878, one man was pitted against eight skilled gunslingers in one of the most remarkable gunfights ever to take place in the Old West in what became the frontier legend of the Battle of Blazer's Mill. Western cowboy, buffalo hunter, and frontiersman, Andrew L. Robert's early life or where he came from. According to legend, he was called Bill Williams of Texas and served as a Texas Ranger. His history tells us that he fought for the Union Army in the Civil War, reached the rank of sergeant before he was released, traveled with Buffalo Bill Cody hunting bison, and earned a fierce reputation as an Indian fighter. At T1 point, he took a load of buckshot in his right hand and was unable to raise his rifle higher than his hip. This earned him the nickname Buckshot Roberts, but did not deter his deadly aim. When the Lincoln County War in New Mexico broke out in the mid-1870s, Roberts ran a small ranch in the Ruidoso Valley near Lincoln. Most accounts say Roberts was a member of the Dolan Murphy faction, which monopolized the county's trade until Alexander McSween and John Tunstall began challenging their monopoly, which eventually led to the Lincoln County War. Because Roberts sometimes worked for James Dolan and was a known friend of Lawrence Murphy, he was automatically associated with the Dolan faction, however, History tells us that he preferred to be left alone, was not easily disturbed, and was determined to have nothing to do with the violence that began to erupt in the struggle for power in Lincoln County. When told that he wanted to choose his side in the conflict, he curtly replied that he intended to take no side, that he had fought enough in his time, and would not fight anyone's battle for him. However, when the Dolan Murphy gang shot and killed John Tunstall on February 18, 1878, it was automatically assumed that Roberts was part of the gang. A warrant was quickly issued for his arrest. In response, Roberts put his farm up for sale, planning to leave the area forever. While staying at a friend's house near Blazer's Mill, his property had been sold and he anxiously awaited his check. Meanwhile, Constable Dick Brewer sets up the rangers to hunt down Tunstall's killers. Roberts' payment was to be delivered to Blazer's Mill, and he checked frequently to see if it had arrived. When he spied a buckboard heading toward the mill on April 4, 1878, Roberts headed in that direction, hoping it might be among the ranch's payment deliveries. Little did Roberts know that the regulators were at the mill and that their horses had been reared. One of the most iconic gunfights ever to take place in the Old West takes place over the next few minutes, as Roberts fights for his life against eight skilled gunslingers and ultimately creates a frontier legend. Buckshot Roberts' last stand Blazer's Mill was a sawmill and trading post on the Rio Tularosa, including a post office, with several other buildings scattered nearby, including a restaurant. Dick Brewer, Frank and George Coe, John Middleton, Doc Skurlock, Charles Beaudry, Henry Brown, Frank McNabb, and Billy the Kid were dining in a nearby building when Roberts tied his mule in front of the mill. Went in to see if his payment had been given. The regulators, who had killed Sheriff William Brady three days earlier, sat comfortably when they spied Frank Coe on his way to the Roberts Mill. Coe soon approached Roberts and tried to talk him into surrendering. However, Roberts refused, believing that if he surrendered, he would be killed by vengeful regulators. Captain Dick Brewer soon grew impatient and sent more men out to force Roberts away. Seeing the armed men, Roberts grabbed his rifle and fired, hitting Charlie Beaudry in the belt buckle and knocking the wind out of him. Boudreaux, on the other hand, was more fortunate hitting Roberts in the stomach. Badly wounded, Roberts continued to fire as he retreated to the mill doorway, hitting John Middleton in the chest, hitting Skurlock's spittoon, striking George Coe in the right hand, severing his thumb and trigger finger, and infuriating Billy the Kid's. Hand eventually, Roberts' rifle was expended, and Billy the Kid rushed the wounded man, using the barrel of Roberts' rifle pointlessly. The gunman then barged into the mill and prepared to continue his defense, armed with another rifle. However, the orderlies stopped their pursuit and tried to talk to Roberts while tending to their wounded. Captain Dick Brewer, however, became disillusioned with his men, and he circled the rear of the building and opened fire. Demoralized by the lone gunman, the rest of the regulators got on their horses and left. Still armed, 
Roberts remained in the building until a few locals finally approached with a doctor waving a white flag. Though the doctor tended to his wound, there was little he could do, and Roberts suffered in agony for another 36 hours before he finally died. He and Dick Brewer were buried side by side at the Small Blazer Cemetery in Mescalero, New Mexico. Later, when Billy the Kid was asked about the gunfight, he responded, Yes, sir. He licked our crowd to a finish. The Frisco shootout was a shootout on December 1, 1884, on a reservation in New Mexico involving Attorney General Elphago Baca. On December 1, 1884, a cowboy named Charlie McCarty was celebrating the good life with a shot inside a saloon in the upper Frisco Plaza. When saloon owner Bill Milligan called for El Figo Baca's assistance, Baca rounded up three local Hispanic men, disarmed McCarty, put away his revolver, and arrested him. What Baca didn't know was that McCarty was a member of the John B. Slaughter Ranch, a notorious brawler outfit. Baca, who is running for Socorro County Sheriff, considered taking McCarty to the Socorro County Jail because the local judge was too scared to try the case. Meanwhile, he and his friends imprisoned McCarty in an adobe house owned by Geronimo Armijo. Soon, word of a Frisco war was spreading abroad. The next day, about 80 cowboys surrounded the house and demanded McCarty's release. When Baca refused, the cattle started shooting. For the next 33 hours, Baca survived by lying on the sunken dirt floor and reigniting through gaps between wooden planks. When the dust cleared, the uninjured Elfgo had killed four cows and injured eight others. Eventually, Baca agreed to surrender to a justice of the peace, but refused to turn over his guns. He was tried for murder, but acquitted after entering the door of Amijo's house as evidence. There were more than 400 bullets in it. The Harrison Levy feud occurred on March 9, 1877, when gamblers Jim Levy and Charlie Harrison got into a heated argument at Shingle and Lock Saloon in Cheyenne, Wyoming. At the height of the conflict, St. Louis gambler and gunman Charlie Harrison insulted Levy by saying he hated the Irish. Originally Jewish but Irish, Levy quickly became angry and demanded Harrison be fired. An experienced shooter believed that Harrison and his accomplice had shot and killed Levy. But they didn't know that Levi was a skilled fighter with sharp shooting skills. The two who continued arguing outside came to the front of the Senate chamber, stopped in front of the French on Edith Street, and left. Both were armed with six guns when Harrison opened fire. Levy took careful aim and shot Harrison as he fell to the ground. Although seriously injured, Harrison was brought back alive to his room at the Dyer Hotel. But he died within a week. Credited with surviving 16 hits, Levy ended the streak in 1882 in Tucson, Arizona. The two argued again about the newspapers, this time agreeing to settle their differences with John Murphy, one of Farrow's dealers at the fashion salon, the next day at the meeting. But the day before, on June 5, 1882, Levy was ambushed and killed by Murphy and two of his accomplices as he was leaving the saloon. Among the early settlers of Lampasaus County, Texas were the Horrell and Higgins families. The Higgins family was the first to settle here from Georgia in 1848. Their son, John Calhoun Pinckney Rose Higgins, becomes a hard-working farmer and an infant who becomes one of the leading players in the bloody feud to come. Shortly after, in 1857, the Horrell family of Arkansas settled near the Higgins property. The families were friendly neighbors until the 1870s, when tensions began to arise between them. As the Horrell sons Mart, Tom, Merritt, Ben, and Sam grew up, they were a rowdy bunch and in 1873 got their first run-in with the Law Dada T this time. Lampasas, Texas was a wild frontier town and in the middle of the battle were the Horrell brothers, whom some called fun loving cowboys but others who were always bored by the shooting. City and Rush to find all kinds of trouble. Gunfight at the Lampasas Saloon in January 1873, Lampasas County Sheriff Shadrick T. When Denson tried to arrest two brothers, Wash and Mark Short, the sheriff was stopped by the Horrell brothers, who shot him and turned him around. Shadrick would later die from a gunshot wound. With lawlessness in Lampasas seemingly out of control, a state judge ordered Texas Governor Edmund J. Davis was asked for help. On February 10, 1873, Governor Davis issued a proclamation prohibiting the carrying of sidearms in Lampasas. The following month, seven members of the Texas State Police arrived to enforce the governor's proclamation. On March 19, they arrested Horrell's brother-in-law, Bill Bowen, for possession of a firearm. 
They then make the mistake of entering Jerry Scott's living room with Bowen. Inside the saloon were the Horrell brothers and their friends. Seeing the officers arresting their brother-in-law, they immediately confronted the officers. Soon after, firing broke out across the saloon, killing four officers, including Captain Thomas Williams, the AS expected more state police. The Lampas Sheriff and Burnett County Minutemen were searching for the outlaw Horrell brothers. Mart Horrell and three other men were later arrested and taken to prison in Georgetown, Texas. However, on May 2, 1873, Mart's brothers and about 30 other cowboys broke into the jail and freed Mart and his friends. Horrible war in Lincoln County, New Mexico. The brothers stayed in Texas for several months, rounding up and selling their cattle. They then left for New Mexico, where they landed in the outlawed Lincoln County near the present-day village of Hondo on the Rio Ruidoso. Keeping up their brawling ways, Ben Horrell, former Lincoln County Sheriff Jack Gillum, and a man named Dave Warner drove into Lincoln on December 1, 1873. After roaming several saloons and brothels, the drunken men started firing guns. When Constable Juan Martinez asked them to surrender their weapons, they complied. However, they soon got more weapons and shot another prostitute. When Constable Martinez and four other officers clashed again, Dave Warner, who had a long-time grudge against Martinez, drew his pistol and shot the constable dead. The lawyers killed Warner and returned the fire, but Ben Horrell and Jack Gillum escaped. The lawmen aggressively pursued the pair, and when they caught up with the two Hellraisers, they pumped their bullets into them, shooting Horrell nine times and Gillum thirteen times. The surviving Horrell quickly retaliated, killing two prominent Hispanic citizens. Sheriff Alexander Hamilton Mills soon rounded them up to arrest them, but they retreated after a scuffle at the Horrell farm. On December 20, the Horrells returned to Lincoln, where they broke into a Hispanic festival, killing four men and injuring a woman. Attempts were made again to arrest Horella, but lawyers were unsuccessful. Warrants were issued for Horrell's arrest as more clashes broke out between Horrell and the Hispanic citizens. In early 1874, the brothers and some of their friends began to travel back to Texas, harassing Hispanics along the way. One Horrell accomplice, Edward Littlehart, killed Deputy Sheriff Joseph Haskins of Pixho, about 15 miles west of Roswell, when the Texans encountered five Hispanic transports. They killed every man. I in total. At least 13 Hispanic citizens were killed by Horrell and their friends. The following year, Tom and Mart Horrell were suspects in the robbery slash murder of a country storekeeper in the southwestern part of Boss County. While incarcerated in the Meridian Prison in Texas, it was broken into by a vigilante mob, and the two were shot dead. Although this may have been a function of vigilante justice, many believe that the Higgins faction had manipulated the incident. The only surviving brother, Sam Horrell, moved his family to Oregon in 1882. He died in 1936 in California. In the 1890s, Rose moved his family to the Spur area, where he worked as a range detective on the Spur Ranch. He died of a heart attack in 1914 at his home. In the 1880, the small town of Honeywell became another transit point for Texas cattle as Kansas cattle towns flourished as beef was shipped east. Located on the Kansas-Oklahoma border in Sumter County, the Leavenworth, Lawrence and Galveston Railroad provided quick access to the Kansas City depots. Upstairs, Hunwell had a hotel, two stores, a barbershop, two dance halls, and eight or nine saloons. Being railroaders and cowboys, violence was not uncommon. Years later, a railroad worker recalled, if Pat Masterson hadn't restricted the use of conventional weapons, there would have been more shootings in Dodge City than I've ever seen. On October 5, 1884, Two cowboys, Oscar Helsel and Clem Barfoot, planted sugarcane at Hanley's saloon. Two lawyers entered the living room and tried to quell the commotion. It is not known who fired the first shot, but Clem Barfoot is said to have fired the first shot. Multiple shots were fired, killing Barfoot and injuring Sheriff's Deputy Ed Scott. No one was charged, and although the shooting was public at the time, it was soon forgotten. Oscar Hulsell later became a wealthy rancher and employed such famous outlaws as Bill Doolin and George Bitter Creek Newcomb. Later, he became the American Hulsell Marshal 8th D. He was a close friend of Nick's. In the spring of 1879, the evil little town of Dodge, Kansas, had not yet been tamed, and it would show itself once again in a shootout at the Long Branch Saloon. The Long Branch Saloon Shootout, also known as the Richardson Loving Gunfight, 
involved Buffalo hunter Levi Richardson and professional gambler cockeyed Frank Loving. Although Richardson was known as a slow and awkward man, he also had a reputation as an excellent gunner. The pair often met at the Long Branch Saloon and became friends, playing the many games that provided. However, somewhere along the line, Richardson developed some affection for Lavon's wife, Maddie, and the friendship dissolved when the two began arguing about the woman. I in March 1879, when the two argued on Front Street, the dispute culminated in a fight. Richardson ended up punching Lavin in the face. However, the unarmed Frank Loving turned his back on Levi and walked away, Richardson yelling, I'll blow your guts out, you cocky son of... A few weeks later, on April 5, Levi Richardson walked purposefully into the Long Branch Saloon looking for Frank Loving. Believing it was time to settle their differences, Levi believed Frank would be in the living room, as it was his favorite place to gamble. But Love was not there. Undeterred, Levi went to the tavern to drink before the pot stove in front of the saloon. At about 9, 0 p. M. Richardson decided that Loving was not coming and headed for the door dot. IT was at that time that Frank Loving went to the saloon. When Frank sat down at a long table, Richardson turned and sat down at the same table. Although no one could hear what they were saying, the two could be heard talking in low tones. Then one heard Richardson say, You won't fight anything, you to which he lovingly replied, You try me. The next thing you know, Richardson has drawn his pistol, and Loving has drawn his in response. The Long Branch Saloon is full of smoke. Charlie Bassett, the Dodge City Marshal, came running from where he was in Beatty and Kelly's saloon when he heard the gunshots. Both men were still standing, but Richardson had fired five shells from his gun in Loving's Remington No. 44 was empty. Deputy Sheriff Duffy pushed Richardson down with a chair, grabbed his gun, and Bassett disarmed Loving. Richardson then got up and walked towards the billiard table, where he fell to the ground with a fatal shot to the chest, side, and another shot through the right arm. Frank Loving, who had only a slight scratch on his arm, was immediately taken to jail. Two days later, on April 7, 1879, a coroner's inquest determined the killing was in self-defense, and Loving was immediately released. Later, Frank Loving is survived by his wife Maddie, two-year-old son John and one-year-old daughter Minty. After Dodge City, Loving moved to another outlaw town in Las Vegas, New Mexico before moving to Trinidad, Colorado in 1882. There he would die, just as Richardson had in the Trinidad, Colorado shootout. April 16, 1882. Such a scene is rarely seen in a civilized city or country as occurred last Saturday evening at the Long Branch Saloon in this city, resulting in the killing of Levi Richardson, a well-known freighter of this city, by a gambler, by the name of Frank Loving. For several months, Loving had been living with a woman for whom Richardson appeared to have developed tender feelings, and on one or two previous occasions, with fatal results, they had quarreled and even come to blows. Richardson had been a frontiersman for many years, and though well-liked in many respects, he had always cultivated bold and daring habits which might get a man into trouble. While such an attitude of his might be called bravery by many, we believe that he is actually the reverse of a coward. He was a hard-working, industrious man, but young and strong and reckless. Love is a man we know but very little about. He is a gambler by profession. When he has a murder on his hands, he's not much of a rascal, but more of a cool and desperate order. His age is about 23 years. If both or one of these two had the desire to do so, this shooting could have been avoided. But both were willing to risk their lives, each confident in himself, and they fought because they wanted to fight. As the following testimony states, they met and one said, I don't believe you will fight. Try me, replied the other, and immediately both drew murderous revolvers, and they went into a room full of men, the leaden missiles flying in every direction. Neither exhibited any sign of desire to escape the other, and it is impossible to say how long the fight might have lasted if Richardson had not been riddled with bullets, and Lavin's pistol had not been left without a cartridge. Richardson lived only moments after the shooting. Loving was jailed and released to await the coroner's jury's verdict of self-defense. Richardson has no relatives in the area. He was from Wisconsin. About 28 years. Together with all the good classes of our community, we are deeply saddened by this terrible incident. We do not believe that it is an appropriate method of settling difficulties, and we believe that it is not according to any law, human, or divine. But if men must continue to settle their disputes by firearms, we are in favor of the dueling system. 
which will not endanger the lives of those on the road or down the road for their own business. We do not know that there is any reason to blame the police, other than to force the police to strictly enforce the ordinance, preventing the carrying of concealed weapons. Neither of them had the right to carry such weapons. Gamblers, as a class, are desperate people. They consider it necessary in their business to maintain their fighting reputation and never make a mistake. They should not be allowed to carry deadly weapons under any circumstances. April 1879 Bartender Adam Jackson's witness statement regarding the Long Branch Saloon shootout. I was at the Long Branch Saloon on Saturday around 8 or 9 p.m. I know Levi Richardson. He was standing by the stove in the saloon just before the commotion. He started to go out and went to the door when Love came to the door. Richardson turned and went back into the house. Love Hazard sat on the table. Richardson came and sat down on the table next to him. Then Loving immediately arose and made some remark to Richardson, which he could not understand what it was. Richardson was sitting on the table by then and stood up lovingly. Loving tells Richardson, if you've got something to say about me, why don't you come and say it to my face like a gentleman and not behind my back, Bally's son. Then Richardson stood up and said, you will fight nothing. You, the rest, will not be heard. Loving said, you try me. When Richardson drew his pistol first, Loving drew a pistol as well. Three or four shots hit Richardson as he fell from the billiard table. Richardson did not fire after falling. He was on his hands and knees. No shots were fired after Richardson fell. No one fired except the two mentioned. Loving's pistol went off twice, and I think Richardson fired twice before Loving's pistol discharged. April 1879 Marshal Charles Bassett's witness statement regarding the shooting of the Long Branch Saloon. I was in Beatty and Kelly's saloon when I first heard the shot. I ran as fast as I could to the Long Branch. Saw Frank Loving, Levi Richardson, and Duffy. Richardson was running around the billiard table. Lovin was also running around the table. After the shooting, I came to the stove. I touched Loving's pistol. Imagine there were two shots after I entered the room. I'm sure there was one dot A as far as I know. Loving took that shot. Richardson was not seen firing, nor was he seen to have a pistol. I examined the pistol shown to me as the one in Richardson's possession. It contained five empty shells. Richardson fell while I was there. Did IT is not possible to say whether the shots were fired before or after I came. I think Lovin fired the shot at Richardson after I came in. Richardson fell immediately after the shot I heard. Did not see anyone else shoot Richardson and did not see Duffy take Richardson's pistol. It is not known whether Loving knew that Richardson's pistol had been taken from him and there was considerable smoke in the room. Loving's pistol was a Remington No. 44 and was empty after firing. A shootout in front of the Oriental Saloon in Tombstone, Arizona, the incident took place between Luke Short and Charlie Storms, both professional gamblers and noted gunslingers, on February 25, 1881. The Oriental Saloon, which had opened the previous summer at the northeast corner of Allen and Fifth Streets, was described as the most elegant, simply elegant, and the finest saloon in town. The bar, carpets, furniture, and live piano and violin music were impressive. Despite its upscale nature, the establishment would see its share of violence in the rough and tumble town of Tombstone. Two eastern compartments are formed. One was the salon and the other was the gaming section. Hoping to maintain a quality environment and attract high rollers, the saloon gave Wyatt Earp a one-quarter interest in gambling concessions in January 1881 for his services as manager and enforcer. Earp enlisted his friend Bat Masterson to assist him, visiting the tombstone in February 1881. Masterson accepted, and he helped out by running the faro tables. Luke, short, cowboy, gunslinger, U.S. Army scout, dispatch rider, gambler, boxing promoter, and saloon owner, arrived in Tombstone in late November 1880, where he met the likes of Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson. Interest in Oriental Gambling Concessions The presence of Wyatt Earp, Bat Masterson, and Luke Short gave the elegant establishment a heightened sense of security. On the morning of Friday, February 25, 1881, Short was working as a bouncer seated near the dealer at a game of faro in the East. T. The table was another well-known gunslinger and gambler, a man named Charlie Storms, who had recently arrived in Tombstone. Storms, unaware of Short's shooting prowess, as he had been drinking all night, started making some rude comments to Short. 
Just as the two were about to take out the six guns, Bat Masterson arrived. Masterson, who was friends with both gamblers, talked Storms into stopping the fight and returning to his room at the San Jose house. For a moment, the conflict seemed to have erupted, when suddenly, while Masterson and Short were talking on the boardwalk in front of the Oriental Saloon, Storms returned, grabbed Luke by the arm, and pulled him off the sidewalk. Storms then went for his gun, but Short beat him to the draw and shot him through the heart, blowing him back and setting his shirt on fire. Luke shoots Charlie again as he falls to the ground. As Storms lay dead on the ground, Luke turned to Short Masterson and said, You sure pick some of the worst people for friends, Bats? One viewer reported that Pharaoh's games went on as if nothing had happened. Bat Masterson, who was in Tombstone at the time, described what happened in a journal article he wrote in 1907. Charlie Storms and Short and I were very close friends, and for that reason, I did not care to see him get into what I knew would be a very serious difficulty. Storms didn't know Short and, like the bad guy in Leadville, made him big as someone with a carefree look who could slap him in the face without expecting a return. As they were both about to draw their pistols, I jumped between them and grabbed Storms, but at the same time asked Luke not to shoot, which I knew he would respect if it was possible without too much danger to his life. He knew I was his friend, so I had no trouble taking Storms out of the house. When Storms and I reached the street, I advised him to go to his room and sleep, for I knew for the first time that he was up all night fighting with other people. I was explaining to Luke when Storms was a very decent man. Look. There he stood in front of us without saying anything and at the same time drew his pistol. Luke put the muzzle of his pistol to Storm's heart and pulled the trigger. The bullet ripped through the heart and as he fell, Luke shot him again. Storm died when he hit the ground. Tombstone City Marshal Ben Sippy arrested Short for the murder of Storm's T. The preliminary hearing, Masterson testified that Short acted in self-defense and Short was acquitted. Arizona Weekly reported that Storms was about 60 years old and is survived by a widow in San Francisco. Shortly thereafter, Luke Short left Tombstone for Dodge City, Kansas, where he would take an interest in the Long Branch Saloon. In June 1881, the original Oriental Saloon burned to the ground in a devastating fire that destroyed much of Tombstone's business district. But East was quickly rebuilt and listed on the National Register of Historic Places on October 15. 1966, and remains so today. The shootout between Owens and Blevins took place during a fierce battle in Arizona in 1887. The Battle of Pleasant Valley took place in Navajo County, Arizona in the 1880s, and was a fierce battle between Grahams and Tewksbury farmers. In September 1887, members of the Graham cult surrounded the Tewksbury cabin and killed two people. A few days later, a man named Andy Blevins, a Graham cult member from Holbrook, Arizona, was heard bragging about killing two people in Tewksbury. Sheriff Holbrook, Commander Perry Owens, heard the confession and obtained an arrest warrant for Blavy for cattle rustling. Now you need to solve the crime. When Owens visited the Blevins' home on September 4, 1887, the family was in the middle of Sunday dinner and Andy refused to leave. Moments later, Andy's half-brother John opens the door and shoots the sheriff, who quickly pulls out his six-gun and shoots John and Andy. A shootout ensued, and 15-year-old Sam Blevins ran to the door and shot Owen. Moss Roberts, a friend of the Blevins family, shot the sheriff. Andy, Sam Blevins, and Moss Roberts were killed in less than a minute of fighting. John Blevins was injured. Built up in 1857 along the Oregon and California trails, Shake Stream Station, Close what is presently Fairbury, Nebraska, is nowadays protected as a Nebraska state stop. The history here is wealthy in its stories of emigrating pioneers and legends of the ancient West. Found along the west bank of Shake River, the station served as a supply center and resting spot for the numerous travelers headed westbound within the 19th century. When it was initially built by S.C. Glenn, the station comprised of small, more than a cabin, a horse shelter, and an improvised store where Glenn sold restricted supplies, roughage, and grain. Within the spring of 1859, David C. McCannells and his brother, James, were on their way to the Colorado gold fields. David got to be disheartened as he met diggers returning from Colorado with nothing in their pockets but disillusionment. Changing strategies, David McCannells bought the Rock Creek Station from Glenn in March, choosing to require up road ranching instead of gold prospecting. McCannells proceeded to work the little store and built a toll bridge over the rivulet. 
Sometime recently, the bridge, pioneers were required to lift and lower their wagons into the stream, sometime recently pulling them up on the other side, very a monotonous prepare that seemed take hours for each wagon. When the toll bridge opened, each wagon paid from 10 to 50 to cross the bridge, depending on their stack estimate and capacity to pay. McCannells too built a cabin and burrowed a well on the east side of Shake Stream, which got to be known as the East Farm. The taking after year, McCannells rented the East Farm to the Russell, Waddle, and Mages Company, which claimed the Overland Arrange Company and established the Horse Express. They introduced Horace G. Wellman as their company specialist and station guardian and contracted James W. Doc Brink as a stock delegate. Afterward, the company orchestrated with McCannells to purchase the station with a cash down installment and the leftover portion in installments. The East Farm was at that point utilized as a range and horse express handoff station, whereas the West Farm kept on be utilized as an wanderer rest halt, a cargo station, and the domestic of the McCannells family. In April 1861, McCannells sold the West Farm to Tankers Hagenstein and Wolf and moved his family to another location approximately three miles south of Shake River Station. Continuously attempting to make cash, McCannells sold the toll bridge a few times with a few particular prerequisites within the contract. When the modern proprietor fizzled to meet the stipulations, he would take it back and offer it once more. In April or early May of 1861, the station enlisted then 24-year-old stock delegate James Butler Bill Hickok, and he got to be quickly a chances with David McCannells, who had earned a notoriety as the neighborhood bully. Purportedly, McCannells prodded Hickok unmercifully approximately his energetic construct and female highlights, as well as nicknaming him Duckbill, alluding to his long nose and jutting lips. Maybe encountering, Hickok started pursuing a lady named Kate Shell, who, indeed, in spite of the fact that McCannells was hitched, clearly had his eye on. Meanwhile, the Overland Company had fallen behind on their installment installments, and on July 12, 1861, McCannells beside his 12-year-old child, Monroe, and two companions by the names of James Woods and James to the station to ask upon the status of the installments. And contention followed not long after their arrival, and obscenities were traded before long driving to gunfire. Within the scuffle, Hickok shot McCannells, and both James Woods and James Gordon, who was genuinely injured afterward, kicked the bucket of their wounds. Twelve-year-old Monroe gotten away to his domestic a few three miles south of Shake Rivulet. Though the points of interest of what happened on that fateful day continue to be talked about, the adaptations shift broadly. Monroe McCannells, who seen the complete occasion, told a version something like this, when David McCannells had not gotten full installment from the arrange company, he arranged to require it up with the station supervisor, Horace Wellman. That exceptionally day, the station supervisor purportedly went to the company office in Brownville to obtain the money, but he returned empty-handed. Meanwhile, James A. McCannells, David's brother, recorded and capture warrant for Hickok, Wellman, and Brink on July 15, 1861, and the trio was charged for the murders of McCannells, Woods, and Gordon. A trial was held in Beatrice, and in spite of the fact that Monroe McCannells resolvedly claimed that his father and the other two men were unarmed, he was not permitted to affirm since of his age. After the trio pled self-defense and defense of company property, all three were cleared. Afterward, when Hickok's notoriety started to spread, he told a completely distinctive adaptation of the story, making McCannells out to be a heartless executioner, and in Ban, who was the pioneer of a horrendous pack terrorizing the local. This story, told by Colonel Ward Nichols and distributed in Harper's Month to Month magazine in 1867, tells an adaptation decorated to the degree that Wild Charge had cleaned off ten of the West's most perilous desperados and was cleared out with eleven buckshot and thirteen cut wounds. Hickok's story portrays himself as scouting for the U.S. cavalry separation when he arrived at Shake River that game-changing day instead of working as a stock delegate. Portraying the McCannells group as careless, bloodthirsty demons, he said he came upon the station to listen a story from Mrs. Wellman that McCannells was inside minutes of the cabin, dragging a minister by his neck with a rope. His story portrays how he battled off the complete McCannells pack with, as it were, a revolver and a bowie cut, murdering all of them within the conclusion and investing weeks recouping from his possessed wounds. Mole. Oh, the complete story can be studied in this article, Wild Charge, this occasion, called the McCannell Slaughter by Journalists, started the wild charge Hickok legend. 
In spite of the fact that Hickok's legend was as of now well known, when the article showed up in Harper's Magazine in 1867, Nichols' glamorized adaptation of the battling wilderness legend encouraged sustained his popularity. No one knows the specifics of this ridiculous and apparently one-sided battle. Various forms have been given, counting stories of envy, robbery, and the progressing struggle between the North and South. A few stories indeed affirm that it was not Charge Hickok who murdered McCannells, but Horace Wellman. Proceeding to be scrutinized a long time after the occurrence and long after Charge Hickok's passing, a man named F.G. Elliot was met by a Works Advance Organization author in 1938. In spite of the fact that not supporting the celebrated story told by Nichols in Harper's Magazine, his story does back Hickok's legitimate slaughtering of David McCannells. Depending upon your point of see, it may or may not include more light on the genuine occasions of that critical day. By 1866, the railroad had come to Kearney, Nebraska, and path activity significantly lessened, taking off the street farmers to discover other occupations. In 1980, the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission started to create the region as a state chronicled stop. Nowadays, the buildings of the first Shake Creek Station and Horse Express have been recreated within the stop, which presently incorporates a few 350 sections of land, a visitor center, climbing trails, excursion ranges, and a campground. The territory incorporates prairie peaks, timber-studded rivulet bottoms, and rough gorges, alongside the profound trenches of the Oregon and California trails, carved more than a century prior by the numerous wagons that traveled westbound along this way. The sandbar battle happened fair north of Natchez, Mississippi, on a sandbar within the Mississippi Waterway on September 19, 1827, when two men, Samuel Levi Wells, III, and Dr. Thomas Maddox, chosen to fathom their issues by partaking in a duel, Jim Bowie gone to as well second. In those days, a second continuously gone to an official duel to guarantee that the right rules were taken after. Encompassing the duelers were a few onlookers, counting well supporters, Major George McCorder and Common Samuel Cuny. Supporting Maddox were his second Major Norris Wright, Colonel Robert Crane, and brothers, Carey and Alfred Blanchard. Others were moreover assembled approximately to observe the exhibition, numbering around 16 men in add up to. When the standards traded shots, not one or the other hit the other, but all hell broke free. From the swarm that encompassed the duel, Robert Crane let go upon Samuel Cuny, and when Cuny fell, Bowie ventured in and terminated a crane but missed. Norris at that point shot Bowie through the lower chest, at which time Bowie drew his long cut, which he was known to wear, and started to chase down Wright. The Blanchard brothers at that point shot Bowie within the thigh, whereas Compose and Alfred Blanchard wounded him in a few places. In any case, Bowie still battled back, diving his long cut into Wright's chest and cutting Alfred Blanchard's lower arm. Kerry Blanchard at that point let go a moment shot at Bowie at that point he and his brother Alfred fled. In any case, Kerry Blanchard was shot and injured by Major McCorder as he ran. In spite of the fact that the fight of the sandbar endured less than 10 minutes, it cleared out common Samuel Cuny and Major Norris Wright dead, and Jim Bowie and Alfred Blanchard injured. Onlookers, who recalled Bowie's big butcher knife, started to spread the word of Bowie's ability with the deadly edge, capturing open consideration and beginning the legend of Bowie's notoriety as the South's most imposing cut warrior. Before long, men were inquiring metal forgers and cutlers to create them a Bowie knife. 